<laughs> okay. So, um, what is NCI? Uh, NCI is um, an abbreviation for National Computational Infrastructure. It's an organization located um, in Canberra, um, and they offer high-performance computing um, and large-scale data and storage um, facilities, mainly end, aimed at uh, computing intensive research, like us, like climate scientists. But also, um, you will also see lots of, of chemistry and other things being done there. Um, so we don't have all this supercomputer to ourselves, unfortunately. Um, the system that when that we're using 95% of the time, I would argue, at NCI is their supercomputer, Gadi. Um, Gadi is very new and it still has a few kinks um, that need to be ironed out, um, but it's it's been pretty operational by now. Um, it's uh, replaced the su previous supercomputer, uh, Raijin. In fact, some parts of Raijin keep living on in Gadi. Um, and if you think of supercomputers, but you really have to think about it's it's not one um, big machine. It's mainly um, a network uh, compromising uh, out of many many computers. So in this case, um, I'm fairly certain, but not 100 percent that that the numbers are correct. Um, but you see, um, it's basically three and a half three and a half thousand or over three thousand computers that are um, connected with really fast um, networking capabilities. Um, it's not your standard gigabyte ethernet, it um, go, goes far, far uh, deeper into the computers themselves. But ultimately, um, you have um, the main thing is these uh, 3,200 uh, 3, nodes. Um, each node consists of two CPUs. And each CPU has um, uh, I'm not seeing 48 cores. Might be 48 cores, yeah. Uh, so each 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 CPU has um, has uh, 24 cores. So these two two CPUs together. Um, have 48. Um, they do have special nodes with um, that are aimed at, at uh, GPU intensive things. So um, if you want to use GPUs, um, are very very fast uh, for very specific tasks. Or if you need something that needs a lot of memory, they also have nodes specifically for that. And they have they might they have a few other special things, but mostly we're using these um, these normal cores. Um, they also uh, provide um, cloud systems. Um, they have a uh, Tension, which they call that private cloud. Um, so you need some sort of collaboration with NCI, and then you can um, ask them to uh, have your own virtual computer on the on the cloud um, if you need it. Um, so my understanding is I'm not 100% sure that both VDI and um, Access Dev are actually on this Tangent Cloud. They also have um, Nectar, which I'm not too familiar with. Um, I, used, I, I personally haven't used it. I know that uh, some of us have. Um, it's a public cloud, so that means you be, need to be affiliated with any Australian university to use that. Um, the virtual desktop um, environment is, as far as I know, running on Tengen. I hope Claire will jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's um, because it's running on Tengen. It does have uh, access, or it's, it can be. It has been config. It has been able to configure it in such a way that it has access to the to to G data, and that makes it um, really easy to work. Uh, interactively with the data sets that are there. So if you, whether whether you have um, work on on CMIP data or on on your mod, on the model output, if you move the if if the data is on G data on Gadi, it's also available on VDI, and it's basically 
a virtual desktop. So you have um, a virtual, you, you, you have um, a desktop system in, in a browser if you use that. Unfortunately, the initial setup uh, can be a bit cumbersome. Um, it's mainly because the, the standard method that they suggest um, uses software that isn't very well um, supported anymore. Um, we can help you, but this goes beyond the scopes of today's um, lesson. Um, if you need to store anything on at NCI, um, there are four different places where you can store. They are different. Um, each one has a different um, objective. Um, you have, of course, your home directory. Um, you have in your home directory you have ten gigabytes that you can use however you like. Um, as far as I know, it's backed up. But of course, it's not not a lot of data. So, but you can use it um, to write to to store your scripts or or things like that. Um, it's also uh, where you where you use uh, you set up your um, working environment um, on Guardi and, and these things. Um, so your your startup scripts and similar things. Then there is Scratch. Scratch is kind of the working directory. Um, the, the the working storage system for um, for Gadi. So when your model runs, you will mostly interact with this um, with this scratch file system. Um, on Rygen, it was called short, um, but um, short never really gave it, uh, was never really accurate. So people were leaving their stuff on short for, well, forever. Um, and so with the transition to Gadi um, NCI, wants to really um, clamp down on using this file system for long-term storage. Even on, on Rajin, they will always say, well, there's no guarantee that the stuff will still be there three months from now. But on Scratch, um, they really, they say, okay, we really take the, uh, we will delete stuff after three months. So do not assume that just because you put a file there, it will still be there in, in half a year. Um, if you want to do that, um, then there's GData. GData is um, long-term hard disk space. So um, it's meant for, uh, we, we, we store, um, for example, ancillary files on that, but that's also where the CMAP data lives and all these other um, data, large data files that need um, long-term storage with, uh, that that you want to work on, um, actively work on, but at the same time, um, they should be persistent. Um, because storage everywhere is limited, um, you have uh, the, the, the disk space on GData is given out per project. And so we, the, the projects have to kind of manage what they put, what what what's they they store there, um, so that they stay within the limits. Again, it is accessible to VDI, uh, which makes which is quite quite convenient. And then there is the mass data. Mass data is basically an archiving system. It's a it's a disk uh, it's a it's a magnetic disk based system. So um, basically, it's it's move. If you said, okay, I'm, I'm finished with this data right now. I don't want to work on it anymore, but I need it archived. I might need it at some later date. Um, you can use it to, you can move it to mass data. It will be um, stored on a tape. Um, it's, I think it's, it's also reasonably well backed up. Um, but it will, it can take minutes um, until uh, it's stored and it can take another, few minutes to bring it up because literally they have a limited amount of, of, of tape drives. So a, a robot in, at their facility has to grab your, the, 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 the tape with your data on it out of, a, out of a cupboard and move it into, the, into one of the reading devices and then it's going to, it's going to be transferred. Um, 
So what do you need to do to get to use NCI? You need two things. You first need to have an account with NCI. Um, the account is basically um, identifies you to in NCI so that NCI knows who you are. But then um, to actually use NCI, you also have to have this account associated. Oh, hey, I, I got a pointer. That's nice. Um, you need to have this account associated with a project. So NCI thinks a lot in terms of projects. Um, all the all the resources that they make available, except for your home directory, are per project. Um, so if you ha once you have the account, you then have to get um, you you then have to apply to be, uh, you have to join the projects and both of these um, are done here. So this this website. Um, this uh, my.ncd.au. Do you see the website or do you see, still see the the um, slide, by the way? We can see the website. You can see the website. So it's a it's a straightforward system. So if you, you need to sign up, um, you need to sign up here uh, uh, for a new account if you haven't done so. Um, this account, from NCI perspectives, this account should stay with you for the rest of your life. So I, I still have the same account that I used to have when I was uh, that I first got when I got when I started work at CSIRO, and now that I work for Monash, I still have the same user account. But of course, I'm now uh, connected to different projects. Um, I'm not going to sign up. I assume that you know how to sign up to a website. But I'm logging in, um, and then if you want to uh, connect to a project. You go to this projects and groups, and of course you can see that I'm in all of the groups because I'm CMS. But if you if you're not, for example, if you if you want to connect to a group, um, if you if your supervisor tells you I know, I want you to get connected to group, I don't know, W76. You type W76 here, and nothing happens. It says no group. Okay, the W35. Um, of course, I can't do this because I'm already a member here, but am I a member of this one? I am a member of this one because of course I am. Uh, I'm a member of that one as well because of course I am. I'm a member of everything. Anyway. Um, if you August, yes, try IK11. Sorry, IK11. Okay, so um, this is a project that I'm not yet a member of, and you get you see here. So the 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 lead chief investigator, that's the person who's responsible. Um, for this project, who to manage this project is Andy Hock. You can say you can send him an email, say, "Oh, look, Andy, I'm going to join you there," and then you would go here to join, and um, you you get here a little text. So, what what is this about? Are there any restrictions? So there might be restrictions. For example, if you access certain data sets, there are restrictions about how you can use the, these data sets, and you have to agree to those. To say you make the tick in down here and say, "Oh, I I agree to that," and then you press request membership, and then uh, Andy gets an email that says um, Holger wants to become a member of Group IK11, and then he can um, approve or reject this message. Um, I usually also drop an email before saying, "Look, I'm going to go come in because of X Y Z," um, but uh, it's not te technically necessary. Okay, so there are so in addition to the projects that your um, that that your supervisor might tell you to join, um, there are some things that supervisor that your supervisor might not uh, that might forget about this. Um, so there is this um, uh, this one is a very important one. HH five. Um, I'll 
I'll come to that in a bit uh, later today. You should all you should all join H join HH5. Um, there are some others. If you if you have a look uh, um, while I talk and think about okay, this might be something that I need for my research. Just um, try if you can see uh, try see if you can join these groups. So any questions so far? Let me open this one again. If you, in case you want to write something down or so. Okay, I don't hear a lot of people. Okay, I'm still, I think I'm, I'm well inside the time. That's good. So, um, the next part will be a little bit more practical. Um, but using MCI, login to Gadi requires Linux experience. Um, you will need to get familiar with Li with Linux um, of with your Linux operating system. Um, we have um, talked about this, so you can use with our training videos on our YouTube channel. Um, there are lots of other really useful resources about how to use uh, Linux and, and the shell system. Um, I strongly recommend that you that you need to get exp experience with that. When you log into Gadi, you will automatically land on one of the four login nodes. So these are four of these small parts, part, computer part, part computers um, that are specifically made uh, so that everyone who wants to access Gaddy? That's that's the landing page, uh, the the landing thing, and that's why they don't really like it if people do computing intensive stuff on there because all the people who use MCI um, will all all use the same computers, and um, they don't want this to block, be bogged down by someone doing computational stuff on there. So um, they monitor this, and if you try to do that, you will get um, you probably will get an email from MCI very quickly. Um, if you actually want to use a job, you need to the, use the queuing system. That is, um, and this is where the um, show show part ends, and this is where the where I'm going to become more practical. So I'm logging into Gadi. Oh, by the way, if you log into Gadi, you always get this message of the day before. Um, these are these are the things that NCI really wants you to know. The, the, there are things about um, about uh, issues that the system had, or maybe upcoming um, things that. So it, it it it's probably a good idea to just browse over it, have a look if there, if any of these things that they talk about um, affect you. Uh, hide this. Hide the panel. Floating controls. Okay, good. So, make my prompt a little bit shorter so that it doesn't take up half the screen. So, um, in order to submit a job, what you basically have to do, you have to set up um, your your a, a script that r runs your job, so that if you if you were just typing. If you were just running this script, it would do everything you wanted to do, and then you tell the the queuing system that you want to do this, and that that's done with the, with um. So, for example, if you uh, let's let's uh, create SSH. If I just run job.sh, job it will do everything I wanted to do. Now, if I want to put this in the queue, I would have to say queue sub. 
drop.sh. And what it do, what it does, it it will produce. Um, it it will basically uh, try to schedule this job on the supercomputer. And I can look at what I have. Um, it's a little bit smaller. So you can see that I have one job running in here that was part of my job. And here is, is the, the job that I've just submitted. It says uh, the job ID, the user who submitted it, the queue, the name of the job, which by default is the name of the script. Um, the number of nodes and the number of CPU, of course, and how much I've requested to run this. Now, um, the queue, there are different queues for the, for the, um, for the NCI, but um, mainly the, main, the three main ones are normal, express and copy queue. Um, the normal is normal. That's your st stock standard um, queue that uh, where you do where you do most of your work. Express is the same uses the, uses the same um, systems, but it, if you run it in a, in the express queue, it gives your job more priority. So if you can think about um, the, the queuing system basically says there are lots, lots of computers, lots of nodes are, are, are always in operation. And you, the, the, the scheduler tries to find a place on the supercomputer for your job to run. And it has, and your job is, is waiting until this, until these computers, and until these cores get available, become available. Um, and with Express, you get a higher priority but at a higher cost, which brings me to the cost. Um, the, everything that NCI does is it, in terms of service units, SUs. NCI account, yes. You can see how many, um, how many uh, SUs your project has per quarter. So in this case, I'm in P66 because I'm working with CSIO at the moment. Um, but uh, they have a grant, so per, per quarter they can use 11 uh, mega um, SUs. So far they've used um, eight and a bit. Uh, reserved, I'm not 100% sure, but that's, that's how much they, they still have. You can look at other projects. Um, uh, by saying uh, by giving options. Are uh, there questions for you in the chat? Okay, okay. I, I'm not monitoring the chat. Maybe that's a good idea. Let me see. So can we please show us the content of your SH file? Ah, yes. So um, if you look, let's hide this again. This the So, in that config, Olga. That config? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's a directory. And in that, there is a guardi login.com. You can see um, the default project. For me at the moment is P66. So um, 
let's go back to the let's go back to the projects again. Um, you can see here, for example, this project IK11 has access to NCI data. So there are no this project does not have any computational resources. It only has access to the to the to storage. Whereas if I look at um, for example P66, you can see that this one has found, has access it has, has access to storage on, on G data. It also has access to storage on mass data, but it also has access to the uh, compute resources. So this project can actually can actually run certain things. Now, um, I think you, there was a question about UNSW. I'm not sure whether this is actually a project. Yes, this, this is not a project. This is just um, an internal thing for them, um, for NCI to, to know where you're coming from. Um, so uh, you need to be a, in a group that has access to, to Gadi, or has access to Gadi to be able to log into Gadi and to be able to to run anything on Gadi, you need to have um, yeah you have these these different projects are different uh, tell you what what you can do if you're a member of this group. Um, can I ask a follow up question on that? Um, yes. So Claire did add me to a project last week. So I guess the question is whether I need to change something on their config to make sure that project is defined for me. Because right now it looks like because I get this response, it's not defined. Okay. So the first thing is you can, of course, uh, or what you should, you sh should create, you should go into this file. I assume that it's automatically there on your home directory on Gadi, and change your default project to whatever to to the project that Claire has, um, made you a member of. Is that okay? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, and then also, if you want to, you can switch projects um, with this command: switch proj. So switch project. Um, so, example, if I want to become a member of W35, um, now um, if I were to now submit the same job again. So I'm now submitting the same job again. Uh, okay, the other job apparently has run. Doesn't tell me. Okay, so here you can see that the the job is now um, is now running as w uh, under project uh, w thirty five. Um, you can about all, but you can also you can also tell QGIS which project you want to do this. Um, you want to um, run this at so. This is so now this project was started as uh, as under project W uh, forty two. Yeah, I'll I'll go I'll go talk uh, I'll go about um, these help things as well. So. Okay, um, we've just start, started talking about the, the SUs, so the, the service units. And, um, and one, one SU on Rajin was, was exactly one core for one hour. But because Gadi is supposedly so much faster, it's now two SUs per core per hour. Um, so if you, if you run a job on four cores, then you will have to pay um, eight SUs per hour that this job takes. Um, 
small caveat again. Um, it also takes into configuration how much memory re you request. So you can say let's um, to you can get several options for this uh, for the QSAP command. You can, for example, tell it uh, that you want uh, to run on four jobs and you want to have four gigabytes of RAM. Um, then I, I then you take type the job and And you can now see that I've, I've this job now has requested four CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM. Oof. Um, and the SUs is always based on the larger one of either the number of CPUs or the num the the amount of memory divided by four gigabytes. So if you want to use, so in the, in this case up here. I've requested four cores and four gigabytes. So that would mean that I would have to pay for this four is the larger of these. So I would have to pay for four, uh, four times two SUs per hour. So eight SUs per hour. If I were to um, do something uh, like this, um, so request 40 gigabytes, then um, I would have to pay 10 times two SUs, so 20 SUs per hour. Uh, if your job needs access to um, needs access to either Scratch or GData, you also need to tell it that. So, um, by the way, the, all these jobs have run. So um, if I look at the output for this, there should be lots of hello clacks. So this is the print statement that we got, and then at the end of the, at, at the end of the file, there's always a um, there's always a, a description about what this job was. So um, it said it, it this ran as under project P sixty six. This was the job ID. It uh, took no time at all. That's why it didn't use any service units. Um, I had 500 megabytes requested. I had 10 hours requested, but it only used eight megabytes of memory and um, practically no wall time at all, and so on. So this is this is actually pretty help, helpful because um, on the one hand side, if you request a wall time, that is shorter than your program than, than your job that actually takes. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm currently trying to do. Um, so mostly it's mostly it's guesstimate. So um, let's see if I have something in there. I don't think so. So one thing you can do is you can look at the at output from a job that's comparable to yours. In this case, I'm looking at an access ESM uh, output that actually used something. So this was a, again project P66, and this here I can see how much service units it actually used. It took two two hours, 15, 14 minutes to complete um, on 266 cores. Um, I've requested far more memory than it's actually used, but that is probably because it's just, um, I assume that this is just, yeah, so that's just um, how much memory, that, that was just uh, automatically requested. I needed 288 cores, so the system said, okay, I'll just request this memory for, for you. 
So this gives you an idea about how, how much wall time you actually used here. So um, I had requested two hours 30, so I, I already knew roughly how much it would take. But if um, the first time I would submit something like that, I would request much longer than I anticipate. And then I just look how much does it take? And then I reduce the amount of wall time. By the way, the wall time, uh, you can do uh, So here, I've, I've, this is how you request a certain amount of wall time. You can also, because um, the job is often often requires certain things um, to be set. So what you can do, you can set uh, here these special flags. PBS means this is a, this is. Um, a flag that you would normally use in the queue sub. So I could say here means um, L storage equals uh, data slash HH5 and G data slash P66 and scratch slash P66. So this means that um, if, if I wouldn't type this in, then the script and the notes would have no access to this data. For GData and for Scratch, you need to add this line story, this storage line. Otherwise, you will not have access to the data. Um, you can also say uh, okay, everything that I've done before. You can say under which project this should run. Uh, for ex but of course, you have to be a member of this project, otherwise it will not run. Um, all these things, because Vim requires me to type escape, and escape always starts to hide this video panel again, uh, this, this uh, floating, the meeting controls. So now I can just type uh, job qsub job.sh. F for full. And you can see all these things that I've that I've requested, the number of CPUs, um, the wall time and all of these things were selected. Okay, um, so far everything has been done in the normal queue and the express queue can give you higher priority at the cost of higher SU cost, uh, costs. So express costs three times as much as normal queue. So I could do minus Q now I want to submit it to a different queue. Express job.sh. Um, and I would expect that this this job would stay would would run a lot quicker in this queue in the system than um, than the other job. Um, but of course, it costs me three times as much. Then there's also the copy queue. The copy queue is the only queue that uh, has where, the, where you have actually access to the internet. It is main, mainly meant to move stuff around. If you want to tar it up and stuff like that, that's probably okay, but don't mean, make any complex computation on it. The copy queue is the only queue where you have access to the internet. So if you need to download certain data from somewhere, that's where you would do it. Um, you can't do that on normal or express because you don't have internet access from from these key, from these nodes. Yeah. 
is the implications. So if you request more than you actually use, well, first you're going to pay for that. For uh, so uh, for for memory and and CPUs, you pay for what you request. For wall time, you actually only pay for what you use. So if you request 10 hours, but you only need, use the second, like my job, I only pay for a second of wall time, but I'm still paying for uh, four cores and uh, four gigabytes of memory. Um, if you exceed what you request, either with memory or for wall time, your job will be killed. Um, it will, uh, you will get um, an error message that your, that your job has been terminated um, and uh, whatever, you, unless your, your job has already been writing stuff out, um, you will lose all your, all your progress. So you do, want to, you do want to request more memory and wall time than you need to make sure that you, that you never get over this limit. But on the other hand, of course, the less you request, the easier it is for the for the um, scheduler to to find the resources that you requested, and the quicker your job start actually starts running. Um, any other questions? <laughs> um, Normally, just start out and request four, four gigabytes for every core. That's the easy. That's straightforward. You're not you're not um, losing anything with that. Um, so the, the I'm, I'm looking at the chat here. The question was um, understand how how do I estimate how much memory I use? Um, I just I just request four four gigabytes per per thing. Other than that, I'm having a look um, how much data I'm going to I, I have to handle. At, and, and have to hand, have to keep in memory at the same time. So um, most floating point numbers are eight bytes. Uh, so if you have a 100 by 200 by 30 field, that's um, 100 by 200. That's 20,000 uh, times 30. So. So you have, what did I say? I have 100 times 200 times 30 times eight bytes. So that field would then be 4.8 megabytes large. Um, that would have to be in memory somewhere. Um, now that's not a lot of time, but if you have, for example, if you have, uh, if you have time, a time dimension as well, so you have, let's say, uh, 100 years times 12 months, uh, then you start to have to uh, megabytes, uh, uh, gigabytes, megabytes, gigabytes. Can do that. So. So then you already need five gigabytes, roughly. Um, to, to just hold the whole, the entire uh, data in inside your array. So can I clarify that further, if you don't mind? Yes, can, please do. So, okay, so for the same setup that you mentioned here, 100 by 200 by 3, 100 years, and 8 by per um, node. So that I understand. And then you mentioned uh, 4 gigabyte, if I'm not mistaken, per CPU that is requested. So, that so if, you look at the, if you look at the nodes, the nodes have 48 cores, and um, I think 192 gigabytes of RAM, is that correct? Yeah, 192 gigabytes of RAM. So um, the thing is, um, each node is has the same. So if you use 48 cores and 192 gigabytes, you basically use one entire node, everything that is there, and 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 you request everything that is there, and you don't waste anything that is there. Um, 
So um, what they don't want is uh, having people request just a single core, but 150 gigabytes of RAM. So because that means that even though you are only requesting from the core count and from the SU cost or, or on how it was on on Rygen, on Rygen you did only paid for the for the cores and not how much memory you, you requested. So you could use uh, you could make the the node unusable to anyone else because no one else can find um, would would be able to run on these other cores without any memory. Um, but you would only pay for a single core. That's why they said for for since the transition to Gadi, um, you also pay you you your your cost is based on the larger of this. But the four gigabytes is basically one core is four one four on uh, has an average four gigabytes of of memory. Okay, so in that sense, if I know the size of my my domain and the number of CPUs that I want to use. Um, I should have a combination of these two that you calculated. One yeah. is the number of CPUs multiplied by four gigabyte, and the other one is to assume that eight byte per grid to hold the data for calculation. So it would be the sum of these two. Is that correct? So, so sorry, um, if you have two, can you ask this question again? No, I just want to make sure that. Um, the, what is requested or in the end is going to be the sum of these two that you showed us here. One is regarding the four gigabytes per CPU that we're requesting, and the other one was the eight byte um, calculation. No, no, no. 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 That's the part I was confused about. Sorry. Um, I, would, I would simply start out just request four gigabytes per memory. That means that you, your job will have access to four gigabytes. So if you you, if you need, let's say you need four CPUs, so, sorry, so four cores, just request 16 gigabytes of RAM. Then okay. your job has 16 gigabytes to do whatever it needs to do. Probably it will use a lot less. Mm -hmm. So just like I, I did, um, if, I, if, I, if I look at this, uh, yeah. uh, if you look at this, so I had requested 1.13 terabytes of, of RAM, of memory, and that's just four gigabytes, this, this number of, of cores multiplied by four gigabytes. Okay? This is just, but um, what I actually used was a lot less, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me because I'm paying for this anyway. Because if, if, even if I were to request less memory, I would still have to pay the same amount of SUs because of these, these uh, because I request so many cores. Oh, okay. So I, that's the part I was so that the, what you pay in the end is not on it's not separately dependent on the memory requests and CPUs, but rather the CPUs is is already considering that four gigabyte per CPU of memory anyway. So it's 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 based on the larger of either mm -hmm. of the either of this the yeah. number of CPUs or yeah. The memory divided by four gigabytes. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Good. Uh, so, um, if we, if if there are no more questions right now, um. Let me go over to the next thing, and that is modules. Um, you can assume that we are a very diverse bunch, and um, well, maybe not us, but the researchers who use the system. As I said, there are climate scientists, but there are also chemists and what whatnot who who use different so type of software. And to have one system fit all of them uh, would be really hard. So you'd run into you 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 would run into lots of inter um, uh, of, of incompatibility issues where um, so that's why um, the supercomputer uses the module system so for example if I were to run um, it has run uh, wanted to compile something it doesn't say it it doesn't find a, a program called iFord now I want 
um, to in order to use the inter, uh, the intercompiler, um, I would have to load the module. The command for that is module load and then Intel compiler. And now I can use I thought minus minus version and it will uh, should be faster than that. So, okay, while well, it's trying to do that, um, now it it knows it, if I've added a module to my to to my environment, basically saying, okay, I thought if, if, if I want to have access to this program or this library or this and that. I'm going to cancel this now. I don't know why it's taking so long. To find out what is available, you, oh, let's let's first first have a list. So I can list my active modules uh, with this command, just module list. And you can see I have at the moment I just have two um, two modules loaded. PBS that is the that is the module that uh, that gives me access to this QSAP commands. Now, if I if I were to unload this, I can't use. I shouldn't be able. Okay, I shouldn't have been able to do that. That's weird. Um, normally. That happens occasionally when people do a module purge. So you can use module purge to just remove all the modules you've loaded. Um, I should have tested this out before I presented this, but okay. Um, if you want to find certain modules, you can use, look module avail. And I'm, I'm giving it certain, I'm giving it that okay already because I know that there are lots and lots of things. You can just just module avail would just give lots and lots of things. But you can see that I have actually different versions of this intercompiler here. Um, one is always the default. So in this case, I just loaded intercompiler and it gave me it gave me this version here, which is the latest one. But that might not always be the case. Um, There's also, um, and this is coming back to this HH5. Um, we have, uh, our CMS team has uh, a list of certain, um, py mainly Python modules that, oh, that we use, that we climate scientists um, use a lot, or that we use in, a lot in climate science. Um, and it would be too much for to ask the NCI staff, they have enough to do to always keep these updated and everything. So we have our own modules. Um, and I would strongly recommend you first, you become a member of HH5. You need to be a member of HH5 under, unless, un, otherwise this doesn't work. But if I if I if I do this, so the default Python version on the on Gadi is three seven seven. If I say G data HH five public modules, and then I load the con module conda. So there are different um, ava available. So this is this is the current stable one. This is the current un unstable one. So this will become the stable one eventually. Now I have a different version of, of Python. In fact, it's an older one, interesting. But in this Python version, I now have um, 
lots and lots of uh, libraries um, Forgot the name. So lots and lots of, of Python libraries um, that uh, I would not normally have. So um, I would um, strongly recommend that you become a member of HH5 so that you have access to that. Uh, in that that means that you don't have to install all these libraries by uh, yourself every time. Time. Oh, it's almost two o'clock. Uh, let me quickly show me the chat. Is there anything new? No. Any questions? So um, NTI have their own help server. Um, it's called opus.nci.org.au. There are many um, helpful links about how to about NCI and how to use it. The user guides sometimes they are a little bit outdated. For example, they still have a Rigen user guide. But most of the stuff on, on, on Gadi is very similar to what, what the, you did on Rajan, to how you did th things on, on, on Rajan. Um, then, of course, there is our own, um, our own um, Wikis, Wiki page where we have um, lots of information about various topics, including um, in the induction about how to set up um, your systems at NCI. Uh, yes, and that's mainly what I was to talk about, and it's almost two o'clock, so are there any more questions? Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. I think we're going to wrap up and the next training will be on um, uh, the basics of Python to be a very, it will be a uh, Python from the point of view of someone who already knows how to program in some language but wants to learn uh, Python and so just a quick overview of the basics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'll see you then in two weeks. Bye.